ya está iniciada la grabación. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome, welcome you all to this third and last session of the Computer Science and Engineering Track in the CCE conference. For today, we have three presenters. Each of them will have 15 minutes of presentation. Then we'll have five minutes for questions. I kindly ask the presenters to please adhere to this schedule. Uh, I will give an alert to the presenter when the when only three minutes are left, and on sharp I will ask them to stop the presentation. Yes, uh, our first speaker today is uh, Carla Campos Cruz. She is presenting the paper entitled uh, "Lightweight Security Protocol for Beacons (BLE)." Uh, so, uh, Carla, you have 15 minutes from now. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, uh, let's start, please. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carla Jocelyn Campos Cruz. And the article uh, was uh, in collaboration with the Dr. Rispania Villa Martinez and the Dr. Guatemo Mancilla Lopez. Uh, I studied my master's degree in the computer department of Simba Staff. And I'm going to present the article titled A Lightweight Security Protocol for Bitcoin's Bluetooth Low Energy. Carla, could you please open your camera if it's possible for you? Oh, okay. Excuse me. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay. And the agenda of this presentation is as follows. I'm going to talk about motivation and some basic concepts to better understand the context of the article. I will explain some of the main security threats in this type of technology. Um, later, okay. later I will expose the previous work that has been done in the last five years. And I'm going to describe the development of the security protocol proposal. And finally, I'm going to show the results obtained and the conclusions and future work. No me deja cambiar. And the motivation and studying and the increasing interconnection of everyday devices in the so-called Internet of Things raise several concerns regarding the security and device and that must be considered to protect the information emitted by them and the application that use them and devices such as sensors, smart bands, and beacons Bluetooth low energy. Uh, many IoT devices are uh, equipped with restricted microcontrollers and that do not have efficient security feature. One of such devices is a beacon that emits Bluetooth low energy signals. The limited resources um, like processing, memory, and power source 
uh, with the buttons battery, for example. Uh, the Bluetooth Low Energy is a wireless personal area network technology used for data transmission over short distance. Uh, the, compared to classic Bluetooth, the Bluetooth Low Energy cannot handle large amounts of data as it is designed for low power consumption in restricted devices. Uh, the beacons Bluetooth low energy uh, are devices that emit a low energy Bluetooth signal. They transmit an identifier that is collected by a compatible application. Uh, this is a smart city uh, with Bluetooth low energy beacons. Uh, the applications. The main application of Vicos technology Bluetooth low energy. Uh, the proximity marketing is the shopping mail, aquarium, and zoo applications. Uh, automatic ident identification, indoor navigation system, and contact tracing. Uh, for example, Trace of contact to detect contagions uh, of the COVID-19. Security trees. Security trees with uh, are the spoofing, unauthorized tracking, information falsification, and show roaming. And the threat, the threat is spoofing. Uh, Adversary can intercept the login request message and through the public channel and impersonate an implication beacons. And other security threat is the forwarding of message. In Tony's application, sending false message can cause problems for users. And other security threat is a unauthorized tracking. Okay, uh, the previous word, uh, we can locate the main beacons communication protocols, the iBeacon protocol of the Apple company, the Ariston protocol of the Google company, and the iBeacon of the Radius Network company. All is uh, compatible, compatible iOS and Android. The Ediston EID it is a component of Google's Ediston specification for Bluetooth low energy beacons. And the beacons emit an identif identifier that change every few minutes. This is a service cloud. Okay. Now the proposal, the thing of the security protocol. This is based uh, for three layers. Based on uh, security protocol as shows in the diagram. The first layer is the socket connection. And the second layer is the protocol ECDH with cures. 25519 and uh, the step is the generation keys and uh, then the public case change and last the shared secret verification and uh, the last layer is the transmitting transmitting ephemeral ids with the authenticated encryption ASCON. and the ASCON uh, is used for the generation hash of the shared of the shared secret generation of ephemeral IDs, transmitting ephemeral IDs, and the veri verify of ephemeral IDs. 
the protocol the Fichelman with elliptic curve 25519 and the image shows the public key exchange scheme and the calculation of the shared secret between Alice and Bob. This is use a public function x25519. Uh, this is a scalar multiplication. And the algorithm, the ASCON algorithm is a family of authenticate encryption and hash generation algorithms that employ the same permutation function. It is a uh, design to be lightweight and easy to implement. Uh, the part of the algorithm is the initialization, associated date, plain text, and finalization. This is winner in the CISA competition, and it is a strong finalist in the night and the nice lightweight cryptography competition. We use ASCON to generate the ephemeral identifiers to be assigned uh, to the Bluetooth low energy beacons. ASCON is used as a pseudo random generate where associate date acting assault. Uh, ASCON is hash mode is used a case generation function and the secret share with Diffie Hellman acts as seed. Okay, the general interaction diagram is the follow. Uh, the side left, the left side, the left side is the server, it's the action server, and the right side is the action client. client. And first, set socket and port of connection, then Y connection. Uh, the client check available devices, uh, choose devices, and the server as a connection. And then uh, the client verify connection and both. Uh, generate of public and private keys with protocol ECDH. Uh, both send public key and receive public key. Uh, compute shared secret. Uh, compute a hash of shared secret with ASCON. Generation of ephemeral IDs with ASCON. The server transmitted ephemeral IDs. The client receive ephemeral IDs and verify the ephemeral ideas. Hey, Carla, you have three minutes to finish, please. Okay. And the comparison of security protocols, the main characteristics, and the encryption type is classic, and the proposal is lightweight with the algorithm ASCOM as on the random generator. The execute of the final program, uh, the, side le the left side is the client terminal and the right side is the server terminal. Um, the application IB key is config tool. I is the, and the UUID of the Raspberry iBeacon is changed for the new algorithm. Uh, we propose a novel protocol suitable for Beacon's Bluetooth log device due to the restriction. The security protocol was based on lightweight cryptography algorithms, such the ASCON family, the optimized software version for a restricted processor, such as uh, ARM Cortex M0. We use to perform the ECDH use the code 255.19 and ask them. Uh, the future goal is the integration of additional cryptography algorithms that will be optimized software version for beacons and the implementation of our protocol could also be applied 
to security communication and then derivation based code have a different use such so, uh, encrypting messages with the lightweight ASCON algorithm. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Carla. Uh, if anybody in the audience have a question, please raise your hand or write your question in the chat. Okay. Carla, uh, why did you decide to use elliptic cure cryptography for this implementation? Okay, this cure is, is very famous. It's implemented to for the WhatsApp application and others. And it's, it's very applicable for these applications. Yes, and it is a, a good choice for lightweight cryptography if you are using asymmetric uh, uh, encryption as it seems to be in your protocol. Uh, did you prove the protocol in real devices? Uh, no, this is a probe in, um, in a Raspberry. Uh, yes, but it was a real device or it was only in simulation? Only simulation, yes, okay. with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, the, the ASCOM family, uh, as you mentioned in, you, in one of your slides, uh, it was finally, uh, it, it is a, a finalist in the competition you mentioned? Yes, ASCOM is a, a It strong. won the competition or it is in the set of the winners? Um, it, it is a, a curiosity, I, I don't know, so I ask. Sí, to todavía no, no se sabe los ganadores. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I, I knew the competition was finished, so it, it will be interesting to, to see if, it, if that algorithm was finally uh, the, one of the, of the finalists or, or the recommended uh, algorithms to use. Uh, and at the end of your presentation, you mentioned you plan to add some other encryption algorithms. For example, what what kind of, of encryption algorithms you can add to this protocol? Mm, repeat this, uh, the question. Uh, you mentioned at the end of your slides in the previous one of these uh, that you plan to add another encryption algorithms. What kind of algorithms or, or what are you planning to, to include in your protocol? Mm. Sí, yes, yes, it is. Maybe, it. To, maybe to replace the, the ASCOM family for another uh, family, maybe. It's a general. It's the... Is the, is the permutation general of ASCOM is used for me for my proposal protocol? Okay, thank you very much for your responses. Uh, uh, Jorge, if you could tell me if we have some questions from the audience, I, I don't see any uh, in the chat. No, I, I don't see either. Questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Carla. Very interesting work. Uh, we we move to the next presentation. Thank you, Carla. Uh, the Thanks. next uh, talk uh, will give will be given by Sara Eugenia Rodriguez Reyes. Please confirm if. Sara is in the room. Yes, I am here. Okay, thank you, Sara. Sara is presenting the paper entitled A Generalized Lagrange Multiplier Method for Support Vector Regression. Uh, Sara, uh, start your presentation, please. You have 15 sure. minutes from now. 
Sure. Give me one second and uh, please let sure. me know when you can see my screen. Uh, uh, no. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yes. I see it. Perfect. And let me start the camera too. Um, okay, cool. So, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. It is my pleasure to be here. I'm very excited. I'm Sara Rodriguez and I'll present you the following work, which is a proposal of a new, uh, of a new model based on a generalized Lagrange multiplier method for super support vector regression. Um, so during the presentation, I'll give a quick summary on the classical support vector machine for regression. And from there, I'll show you where does this motivation to make a new model proposal comes from. I'll present the new proposal of machine with some application examples and finally a conclusion. OK, so as I mentioned, I'm going to give a quick summary on the classical support vector regressor. So this model tries to find the best hyperplane that best fits the data. The idea is to consider a margin distance called epsilon. This one in here. Uh, where we expect all the values to be in a tube around our hyperplane. The idea of this tube is to cover the most quantity of data that we want to model for our algorithm. Obviously, not all of the data fall inside of this tube. That's where these slack variables emerge that quantify the error made between the, the approximation and the real value of each data point in our data set. When defining the hyperplane, only the values outside of this, this, this band or tube are considered. Values within the, the margin are ignored for the final formula. In this case, the out-of-band values are considered as support vectors. Okay. Um, the vast majority of books introducing support vector machines first state that the primal optimization problem and then go directly to the dual formulation. There are two main reasons of why solving this problem in the dual. First of all, first of all, uh, the duality theory provides a convenient way to deal with the constraints that comes from the primal problem. The dual optimization problem can be written in terms of dot product, thereby making it possible to use kernel functions. If you are not so familiarized with the kernels, uh, with, the, with the term, a kernel is a method that transforms linear inseparable data that it's all scrambled to a higher dimension where we can now, it, it can be now linearly separable. Okay, so coming back to, to our topic, one step before the dual, we determine the Lagrangian and uh, the idea is to, to build a Lagrange function with the objective function uh, that comes from the primal and the constraints, introducing some dual variables. One, once each variable is partially derived from the primal and substituting the results in the Lagrangian, we obtain the dual. This is the function that most uh, of the programming languages uh, work with. For example, in Python, Scalary, they use the, the dual formulation. And um, after doing some variable substitutions and setting the dual in, the, in its matrix form, we obtain the following dual, where we get a term uh, with an absolute value. Here we can see the connection between the support vector machine and the lasso regularization. Okay, so the L1 regularization or lasso is, a me is measured as the mean of the absolute co coefficients, um, absolute value of the coefficients. And on the other hand, the L2 regularization or reach is measured at the, as the mean of the square values of the model coefficients. As I was mentioning here, we see the connection between the support vector machine and the L1 or lasso regularization where lasso explains the presence of support vectors. And then why does these regularization terms help? Because they help to minimize the complexity of the model at the same time that we minimize the, the cost function. It makes that the model is simpler and that it generalizes better. Then 
if we have a lasso regularization that comes directly from the primal, from the primal formulation, as, as we saw, then why not adding a rich regularization? Lasso is useful when some support vectors are irrelevant, it removes them, and rich serves to, to decrease the support vectors that are correlated to each other. Here comes the motivation of this work on adding this rich regularization, the regularization that should appear on the, on the dual two. It is important to mention uh, that this combination of the lasso and the rich is called elastic net regularization, just in case that you hear me talking about that. Okay, uh, so with the aim of proposing a new type of support vector regressor, considering the original primal problem with the following Lagrangian based on a generalized Lagrange multiplier method with a square term is added. This function fulfills all the, con all the conditions of the generalized Lagrange multiplier method. Finally, after doing some math, this leads to the following dual problem, where after defining some variables and reformulated the dual problem in terms of beta in a matrix form, we obtain a dual formulation where we get a new proposal of model that offers a new structure that proposes an elastic net regularization. Here is the absolute uh, term of lasso and the square term of, of reach, with also the appearance of a new hyperparameter called lambda. Um, so in order to test the performance of the new model proposed in this work, Two known data sets are used to solve a regression problem. In the two examples, the epsilon, the gamma, the dc, and the lambda hyperparameters um, were, were um, tuned using a Bayesian optimization algorithm with the goal of minimizing the mean absolute uh, error metric or, or MAA. This one. In order to get a fair comparison against the new model proposed. And uh, why the MAA, the mean absolute error? Because it is a good metric to evaluate model performance against different methods, uh, or a model, sorry. Uh, it is a more natural method measure of average error, since intercomparisons and of average model performance error is the goal. This metric is our main focus. We begin with the known Boston housing dataset that can be accessed from the scikit-learn library, where the objective is to predict the value of prices of houses. There are 406 uh, samples and 13 variables in this dataset. The model proposed in this work, which is the extended support vector regressor, is compared ag against multiple, mo multiple models, like the multiple linear regression, regression the random forest, XGBoost, and the classical support vector regressor. Data scaling was also applied to all variables previously. The partitioning of the data is 70% uh, training data and 30% de uh, testing data set. And additionally, a model is trained using the symbolic transformer method to perform a feature engineering process before the training. This one only has a purpose to test if there is an improvement in the performance of, of the new model. Uh, the comparison between the models was made using the metrics of R squared, the MAA, and the mean square error. As can be seen, the proposed model with the transformer, the, the symbolic transformer, um, manages to improve the MAA uh, compared to the other models. Additionally, having the highest R squared. Uh, score and the lowest mean square error metric. Uh, so all metrics still indicate that the extent, the new extended Lagrangian support vector regression model provides a very good fit to the data set. Um, additionally, the diabetes data set contains features about different patients where the objective is to predict a quantitative, quantitative measure of disease progression of one year after baseline. There are 442 uh, samples in this data set and 10 features on, on, the, on, the, on the whole data set. Uh, the models that were implemented are the same models as, as using the previous example, using the same pre-processing uh, process and data partitioning logic. As can be seen in the table, uh, the proposed model 
also using the symbolic transformer data transformation, manages to improve the, the MAA score as it has uh, this lowest uh, metric. Results are very competitive with the XGBoost, as you can see. We have only tested this model with these two data sets, but the goal in the new future would be to use it with more, with much more uh, databases. But we, the, the theory took us some time to, to implement. And um, about achievements, so we created a new model proposal based on a generalized Lagrange multiplier method for support vector regression base, which includes a weighted elastic net structure. It was shown in the examples that the extended Lagrange support vector regression models out outperform the classic support vector regressor models. This new model proposal with the new elastic net structure leads to very good results. Uh, it gives the possibility to reduce the number of support vectors uh, used to create the model through the lasso or L1 norm. And also, the L2 or reach gives some stability in case that some support vectors are correlated. Um, a disadvantage of this model, new proposal model, uh, would be the increasing time of the op optimization for the new hyperparameter lambda, which is not that much, to be honest. Uh, in the Boston data set, it took around eight, mi in eight minutes to optimize the new model and around five minutes to optimize the classical support vector. Uh, so it's a difference of three minutes only, um, but this time could incre increase more if the hyperparameter search is exhaustive, exhaustive like, like grid search or random search. The process will suffer from the course of the dimensionality. Um, the number of times required to evaluate the model during hyperparameter optimization grows exponentially in the number of, of, of parameters. Uh, this is the reason why we use intelligent methods like Bayesian optimization in this work, where better performance models can be obtained since this method requires fewer model uh, evaluation and has lower variance because it intelligently searches the, the parameter space. Uh, so I think I went very fast. Um, and thanks for, for your attention. That's it from my end. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Thank you very much, Sara. It was a uh, uh, fast but amenable uh, presentation. Uh, please, uh, see if someone has a question, raise your hand or write your comment or question in the chat. Uh, Sara, uh, is there still room for improvement in this method? Um, yes, of course. Um, there are a lot of things that can be done, but thinking about it, we can. We, the goal right now is to try this with the classification problem. So right now we we have only tried with regression, but um, we are thinking on trying this on classification. It, it seems to be uh, okay. Sorry, and in the script on the on the code, uh, we use some optimizers that could be improved. We can try it with other other libraries in in Python. So we did this, this script in Python, but we could try other 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 libraries and see if the the optimization is a little bit faster. That's another improvement. Okay, uh, it seems to be a very good uh, contribution. Uh, are you planning to extend this work to submit for a journal, for example? Um, yes, in my heart, yes. I haven't done anything yet, um, but I have thought about it. Would be a good idea. OK. I don't know if anyone else has any other. I, I, I don't see questions in the chat, nor hands raised. So we thank uh, Sara for her presentation of this work. Uh, thank you. We move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, the last and third presentation will be uh, in charge of Andres Manjarres Garcia. He presents the paper entitled Edge Computing 
system on chip implementation of compressive sensing, sensing algorithm for single pixel cameras. So Andres, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Can okay. I can turn on my my camera? I don't know if can you see my camera? Uh, no. We don't see your your face. Uh, it it seems the camera is uh, disabled. Okay, I think that you can see now. Okay. So I uh, I am Andres Mauricio Mahares Garcia, and I will present our work: Edge Computing System and Machine Implementation of Compressive Sensing Algorithm for Single Pixel Cameras. Uh, so, single pixel cameras are an emerging technology that allows us to capture. Yes. Uh, uh, we, we, we don't see your, your camera on. Also, you're not sharing your, your ah, screen. Sorry, sorry. It's weird because when I share my, my presentation, my, my camera is. But you can see me now. Can you see me? see you, but, but we didn't see we don't see your presentation. We I have a mention. We stop at your video when you started sharing. Yeah, uh, can it be a problem with the uh, tool, Jorge? Is there a restriction? It's okay. Yeah. Uh, with the problem, it's okay. I think you can uh, only share your screen and, and use your, your your presentation. So, what can I do? Uh, yeah, just go ahead with your presentation. It's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So, I will start again. Uh, my, I am Andres Mauricio Mahar Garcia, uh, and I will be presented our work Edge Computer System Ship Implementation of Compressive Sensing Accordion for Single Pixel Cameras. So the single pixel cameras is an emerging technology that allows us to capture an image using only one sensor. To do that, the single pixel cameras project a set of predefined patterns onto the SN and then capture the reflected light using one single sensor. Then using the measures and the patterns and using a reconstruction algorithm, we can recover the image. Uh, these reconstruction algorithms are have two approaches. The statistical uh, model use a correlation uh, between the patterns, uh, between random patterns and the measures to recover the image. Uh, usually these correlation functions requires a, a, a large number of patterns to reconstruct a good quality image. The second approach is a deterministic models that uses orthogonal bases as the set of patterns and then they assure full reconstruction if the number of patterns is equal to the number of pixels in the image. And also the deterministic model reduces the number of patterns. This is not enough. So now the compressive single cam uh, the compressive uh, sorry the single pixel cameras uses a uh, compressive sensing to reduce even <coughs> even more the number of patterns that we use. This is the scheme of the single pack pixel cameras used today. We have an illumination source that generates, uh, generates the light. Then this light reflects onto, onto a digital micro mirror device. 
these, mir these mirrors have the, the patterns and then they project the, the patterns onto the onto the scene and then using a, a single sensor, usually a, a photo detector, we can measure the reflected light. And then using our station, we implement our reconstruction algorithm and we can recover the image. Uh, these cameras has a lot of applications. Uh, one is use a uh, change the, the wavelength of the light projected and makes that the patterns that we are projecting uh, interact with objects outside of the visible spectrum, as for example, a gas. And you can use, use this for, for gas leaks detection. Another application is use the time of flight of the light that we project and the light that we collect to estimate the depth of the objects and generate 3D images. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, the scheme of these cameras today use uh, a workstation to reconstruct the image. So this limits the portability of the single pixel cameras we can put, for example, a single pixel camera in a drone because we need a, a workstation to reconstruct a, our images. So in this work, we propose an implementation of, a, of an image reconstruction algorithm for single pixel cameras in embedded devices to provide portability to these single pixel cameras. So first, I will talk about some background of the reconstruction algorithm that we use. We use TBL3 algorithm. This algorithm solves the, the, the compressive sensing uh, problem by minimizing this function. This is the, the function uh, of compressive sensing with total variation regularization. This is a constrained equation. So to solve this equation, the TBL3 algorithm use uh, the augmented Lagrangian. So they calculate the augmented Lagrangian of the function. This is an unconstrained function. And they minimize, then they minimize this uh, augmented Lagrangian using the augmented Lagrange method. This is an iterative uh, method that in each iteration compute the minimization of the augmented Lagrangian uh, function, uh, update some multipliers and some penalty parameters. And to minimize the augmented Lagrangian function, they use another algorithm, the alternate, direction, the alternate direction algorithm. So this method split the, the minimization problem in two minimization problems, the W minimization and the U minimization. And this is another iterative process. So this is an, a, a diagram of the method that we implement to, to solve the compressive sensing problem in single pixel cameras. Now I will talk about our solution. As I mentioned, our goal was implement um, this uh, image reconstruction algorithm into the into embedded devices. But usually uh, when we move to embedded device, we lose some, some performance because we are using now a, a smaller uh, processor to address this. We use a system on chip, especially uh, specifically, we use the SignQ 700 uh, system on chip that combines an ARM CPU with an FPGA. And we use this FPGA to accelerate the most time consuming part of our algorithm. The, the, the most time consuming part of the most computational expensive part is uh, the matrix multiplication. This is the expression. I don't put the equation, I only put the equation on, in which we can see the, the matrix vector multiplication. This matrix it contains all the, param the, the patterns that we are projected on our object. <laughs> U is the image that we want to reconstruct. And B is the measure that we are receiving from our single pixel sensor. And for example, to reconstruct an image with 64 by 64 uh, p 
pixels using a compression rate of 70%. Uh, the size of our E matrix will be 4056 by 1024. So we will need uh, at least 4 million of multiplications to perform the one vector, a uh, matrix vector multiplication. And in each iteration, usually we'll need to, to perform two of these matrix vector multiplication. And in some cases, we will need to perform a uh, four. So to, to implement this on the FPGA, we use a high level synthesis, HLS, and we use the, the data flow optimization to obtain task level parallelism. So we can, uh, we have three tasks, read, compute, and write in the read stage. We read uh, the matrix and the vector from the global memory using two uh, high performance AXI ports. We, but since the matrix don't change between, between iterations, we only load it once we load it into the local memory, the FPGA. And then to compute the, the matrix vector multiplication, we use a strategy to obtain pipeline uh, performance. So we read the matrix in column major order. So we read, for example, the first major, the first uh, column of the matrix and the first element of the vector, multiply them and obtain an output vector, then move to the second uh, column of our matrix, multiply this by the second element of our vector, and then add uh, this new vector, output vector, with the previous output vector that we stored in a temporal uh, array on the temporal buffer inside our FPGA. And then we write uh, our output vector, our final output vector into the global memory. So to evaluate our implementation, we use a um, low cost board. We use the microset board that implements a sign queue 700, uh, 2000 FPGA or system on chip. Uh, and we use the new BDS platform that Silence provides. With this tool, we first generate the platform, the software, and the hardware for, for support our, our platform. These this platform, this BDS platform, uh, uses AXI ports, uh, general purpose AXI ports to communicate the processor with the FPGA and send some commands like uh, run the kernel or load the data. And then, as I mentioned, we use high performance AXI ports to communicate the kernel with the external uh, DDR3 memory. This is the resource consumption of our platform. And these, res these resources are used to implement all our interfaces. And this uh, user budget is the remaining uh, resources that we can use to implement our kernels. We implement two kernels, one for the matrix vector multiplication of A and the other for the transpose. The first experiment that we perform performed is the we compare three different architectures with three different data types in an image reconstruction of an image with 64 by 64 pixel and a compression rate of 70 uh, 25 percent so uh, one architecture implements uh, the computation implements a uh, arithmetic of a 32 bit floating point the other use fixed point with uh, 32 bits, nine for the integer part, and the other use uh, 27 bits. This is a fixed point implementation using 27 feet bits and eight for the integer part. In the reconstruction time result, you can see that the three architecture uh, reconstruct almost in the same time. But if you look at the PSNR result, you can see that the T2 floating point outperforms the result of the other architectures. And if you look at the resource consumption of this architecture in categories as look at tables as memories or flip flops, VRAM and DSP, all the three uh, implementation 
consumes almost the same amount of resources, but in the loot uh, category, the 32 floating point architecture uses less than the others. So for this reason, for the PSNR result, it's the peak signal to noise radio, sorry, this is a metric to measure the quality of our reconstruction. So for these two reasons, we use uh, the 32 bit 14 point precision to implement the rest of our architecture. So the second experiment using this 32 bit 14 point precision is a comparison between multiple compression rates. So we reconstruct an image, a 64 by 64 image using different compression rates. And we also implement a fully CPU uh, version. So the red light indicates an implementation that only use the ARM processor on the system chip device that we use. And the blue line indicates a, a reconstruction, but with the, the acceleration part on the FPGA. And this, this implementation for our, acceler our acceleration is up to 11 times faster than the CPU version. We also uh, compare the results for different image sizes. So we change the size of the of our image. And we also implement a CPU version. So you can see here that in the smaller image, we the difference between the CPU and the FPGA or, or our accelerator are less than the difference in the bigger images. So we can see here that the, if we decrease the size of the image, the difference will be shorter. And if we increase, the difference will be increased also. So the conclusion of our work, we can conclude that the compressive sensing algorithms for applications such as single pixel cameras represent a rich field for embedded development. And it was uh, found that a small system can run complex reconstruction algorithms such as a the TVL3 algorithm and improve the time performance by using hardware acceleration. We also found that the fixed point implementation shows no improvement over the floating point arithmetics. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andres. Uh, very interesting work. I have some questions in the last uh, slides. The size of the image is in in pixels. In yes. Okay. Sorry. See, it's pixels. You you measure uh, improvements regarding the CPU, but what about GPUs? Did you have an estimation? In what, in what uh, how, how faster is the FPGA implementation regarding a GPU? Okay, so very good question. Uh, I don't have a comparison of these results, but uh, I must say that I think that maybe GPU can uh, I don't know, uh, reconstruct an image maybe in, in less time with the FPGA implementation, but also uh, an important, and it was a decision a decision that we take at the beginning of our research, uh, was that uh, the power consumption, I don't mention the power consumption, but if, if we are planning to, for example, implement these cameras in a, in a drone or a autonomous vehicle, we need that these cameras consume very few joules, or very few watts of of energy, so we address our direction to the FPGA solution. Uh, I think that's the reason you are using a small F FPGA. Also, yes, yes, also because that. Okay, uh, are you planning to implement this design in ASIC? For now, no, because we are exploring a other alternative, for example, uh, using a, another matrix or a vector implementation, uh, not matrix vector implementation, other uh, sensing uh, matrices. And we, to make an ASIC, an ASIC we, we, we want to uh, 
be sure about our implementation. And also, uh, we, we, we like the flexibility of these PGAs because we can implement in this, in, for example, in this case, we can implement uh, designs with a, a lot of image sizes and we can fit them to be as yeah. smaller as possible. For Let's example, take advantage of the configuration. Yes, of course. I don't compare, for example, the, the consumption uh, of these three different architecture, but for example, the 16 by 16 uh, implementation is smaller, it consumes fewer resources than this implementation. They change with uh, the image size, the, the amount of resources that they use. Very interesting work, Andres. Uh, Thank you. We don't have more questions. Uh, I would like to thank all the the audience and the presenters of this uh, last session. We conclude this this activity. Uh, we invite you to attend the closing ceremony at two and fifteen. You're back in a, a few minutes, so please stay connected and continue in this transmission. Um, it will be all. Thank you very much.